on the 586th of the 5th of January 2020, coming to you today live from Monterey Skeptic Camp. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You all get paid in Australian dollars later. <laughs> coming up on this week's show, uh, I and Tim Mendham recently wrote an article for the Skeptic Magazine, the journal from Australian Skeptics, about psychics, people who claim to talk to the dead, uh, performing at RSL clubs in Australia. A very concerning report to kick off this week's show. After that, it's Maynard's spooky action. Maynard, back at Skepticon 2019 in Melbourne, he looks at the sales of the SGU book, talks to Bob Novella, Sam and Ross, and even Mark Edward makes an appearance on this week's show. Like I said, it's wonderful to be here. I must come back for a summer holiday, I think, in this area. It's, it's, uh, I've been here a couple of times, and I've stayed with Susan and Mark. It's just been wonderful. But now, it's time for me to get on with my talk. And while I do that, I hope all you listening enjoy this week's episode of The Skeptic Zone. Side bit of the magic of making a podcast now. <clears throat> Thank you for listening to the skip. <laughs> I want to get laughs from the audience now. <laughs> Coming up on next week's show, a report about Skepti Camp here in Monterey. Also, more from uh, Maynard at Skepticon in Melbourne. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from California. Put that into my iPad and away I go. All right, so I think I have a clicker over here. Yes, you sure do. Sitting there waiting for you, no problem. Here it is. Well, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My talk today is about some of the activities and adventures and things the Australian skeptics have been doing over the last almost 40 years. We are one of the oldest skeptical organizations in the world. That's our one of our current logos there. The Skeptical Koala. Now before I start, before I start, and thank you to everybody who has been asking me, yes, the fires, the wildfires in Australia are simply the worst in our history. It is bad, there is no putting a, a good uh, face on this, it is very bad. It is hundreds of people have lost their homes, uh, millions of animals have perished, and it's getting worse. The army have been mobilized for the first time in our history to evacuate people, the Navy, our biggest ship. So it's very concerning. If you're interested, I can recommend on YouTube, search for ABC News 24. That's the Australian news service around the clock, and we can give you the, the latest information. So just so you know, I am very concerned. I haven't been there for a few weeks. But it, it is a heart-wrenching situation. Getting back to the Australian skeptics. We have been going since the early 1980s. I'll take this one. Oh, quick, a little bit about these. Sorry, yes, I'm a life member of the Australian skeptics, former president of the Australian skeptics. I'm also a fellow for the Committee for Skeptical, In Skeptical Inquiry. I was on the James Randi Educational Foundation's Million Dollar Challenge Committee. I've been on TV shows. I do a school show about science and skepticism, a podcast. I've written books, many books for children, many on origami, as was mentioned before. I'm a documentary filmmaker, uh, and I do some other stuff in my part-time. I'm not sure what. <laughs> so when, when I find the time, to bend a few spoons, I think that's what I do. And there's just some of the origami I do. I invented the flying pig for James Randi, Pegasus, the flying pig, and I do jewelry and things like that. I didn't invent the alien, but what a wonderful combination of skepticism and origami, isn't that? <laughs> a wonderful model. I love making the, the, the alien. I wish I invented it. I really do. I wish I invented it. <coughs> the Australian skeptics were formed in 1981, just after, in 1980, a visit by James Randi. Is that a, a laser pointer on his one? Yeah. It's, it's the uh, top button on that. Section. The red button in the middle. The red button? Ooh. There's Ooh. Randy there. <laughs> he uh, came to Australia in 1980 and he requested this gentleman, Dick Smith, 
who was one of the patrons of Australian skeptics, who was a multi-millionaire uh, and got interested in skepticism. And we, uh, they, in the, uh, way back in 1980, had one of the world's biggest water divining tests. And after that, as it was broadcast on television, interest in Australia started to grow and the Australian skeptics were formed. And this gentleman here, Barry Williams, who died only a couple of years ago, was a key figure in the history of the Australian skeptics. He was the editor and the president of the organization for a very long time. And we have the Ben Spoon Award for almost 40 years for the perpetrator of the most preposterous piece of paranormal or pseudoscientific piffle. <laughs> and that's been won by psychics and various TV shows who let the side down as far as science is concerned and things like that over the years. Susan's got one of those drop bear t-shirts somewhere around. Yeah. And indeed there's myself when I was president a few years ago with uh, James Randi in Melbourne at one of the, uh, one of the times we presented the uh, Ben Spoon. I think that was to a group of homeopaths who were selling water as vaccination for whooping cough. <laughs> they won the Ben Spoon that year. As I said, water divining was one of the reasons the Australian skeptics really got going, and it is still, I think, that one of the biggest topics, believe it or not, after all these years. It's a fascinating, uh, that's, oh, that's me, by the way. I need some more divine. And it's worth Googling and looking and looking at documentaries online about water divining, because it's a wonderful way to introduce people to skepticism. Uh, James Randi made a, a movie, as I said before, it's called James Randi in Australia. If you Google that, that's on YouTube. I've made a documentary myself on water divining. If you Google my name, Richard Saunders, and water divining, you'll find my documentary. But because we use a, double blind, a random double blind test to, to test water dividers, it's a great way to introduce people to skepticism. So I like water divining on that level, I really do. And these characters are wonderful characters, like this fella here, with a cricket ball on the end of a uh, string. That's how he finds water. It's a fascinating topic, I love it. And of course, let's not forget, spoon bending. Spoon bending is really important in the history of skepticism, going back to the 1970s with Yuri Geller, of course. And, you know, it, it is a bit of a trick. I mean, I, if, if I get a no, oh, an Australian skeptic stand. How about that? I'll be giving them away later. You, you've all seen this trick. If you get a, a pen like this and you wiggle it, it looks like it's rubbery, right? <laughs> yeah. It really does. So, magicians a long time ago discovered, and I think I've got some, oh, see some uh, years ago, that if you get a spoon, you can do more or less the same sort of trick and make it look like it's wiggly and bendy. I mean, you can, you can, people say, please bend a spoon. I say, sure. Hey, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Cheating a little bit. <laughs> but you saw what I did with a, a pen, making it wiggle and wiggle. You can do the same with a spoon. And it's not that difficult. You just have to hold it here. You concentrate and you wiggle the bottom. And people expect it to bend, so their minds are sort of geared towards that. See that? And you can do that at home with a, with a, with a, a spoon or a pen, and people really start to think that with you see that. Like the pen, your brain is completely tricked, and you're starting to think that's getting rubbery, which of course it's not, because you can't, be, um, you... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I did that, everybody applauded. <laughs> When I do that for school groups, and they say, what's spoon bending? <laughs> Which is really good, because if it was a real thing that psychics did in the 70s, it would be part of our culture. It would be part of science, it would be everyday knowledge. The kids say, what? Spoon bending? What do you, how do you do the trick? Says to me that, you know, obviously it, it's not a real thing. Of course, we all remember Gary Geller, who was the psychic superstar of the day in the 70s and the early 80s. Um, and Mark Edward better leave the room, he's going to kill me for this. This is, this is one of the videos that got one of my channels kicked off when Yuri Geller filed a complaint against me. 
Let me see if I can play this. And I just, I play this to people because there are still people who say Yuri Geller was the real deal. Here he is bending a key. I think it's Italian TV or something like that. Now, if you look, you know, if you impose this angle on what he's doing, of course, the key doesn't bend. He's just moving the angle of the key. This is Yuri Geller's own hands, and you can see clearly he is not bending the key. I mean, I know how the tricks work, of course, but I thought this was a good example to show any doubters out there. God, the skeptics. Hang on, I've got that backwards. <laughs> any believers that, honestly, that this is a trick. I had a big argument with the president of the Australian Psychics once who told me that he was this close to Geller when Geller bent the spoon. And I just couldn't get through it. I couldn't get through it. It was quite interesting. Another big thing that we did in Australia, <clears throat> 10 years ago in fact, there was a company selling power balance. Power balance was basically an elastic band, rubber band you put around your wrist with a couple of one or two holograms here mass produced in China, Chinese factory, imported around the world, exported around the world, we discovered that they cost roughly 10 cents to make and they were being sold in Australia for $60. $60. And it, the story appeared on one of our TV programs. I happened to watch it and I saw tricks I knew. I contacted the producer of the TV show and I said, I can show you how this really works. And they flew me from Sydney to Adelaide, a different city, and I appeared on their TV show. And the secret is supposed to be locked up in that hologram, says Tom O'Dowd, whose company sells them for $60 in Australia. The frequency that's been embedded in that market <laughs> technology in the, the hologram, what it does, it reacts with the electrical field of your body. That's plain nonsense, according to Richard Solomons from the Australian Skeptic Society. No, I'm not convinced, not yet. I mean, I can be convinced, we'll see what, what happens. With Richard looking on, we asked Tom to put the claims to a blind test using six volunteers. More on that shortly. So, on to our tests. Tom carried out his usual balance and strength routines, using a card embedded with that hologram, then with the bracelet. All six reported a positive reaction, that is, when they could see it. Yeah, that's working all right, don't you? Okay. Feel the difference? <laughs> Richard thinks it might have more to do with physics or the angles which Tom is exerting his force. It's actually your controlling whether the person is weak or strong, not, not the pendant. Next, a series of blind tests. I randomly placed six cards in their pockets, only one fifth in line had the card with the hologram. It was up to Tom to detect who had it. Well, I'm going to take a real stab at it. I'm going to say, you go. <laughs> so let's have a look in your pockets. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there you go. Ooh. No, I don't have it. Oh. 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 Okay. So what I did is I simply constructed a very simple test using a dice and six volunteers. Uh, he attempted five times, he failed five times in a row, and I said to the um, reporter, I took him aside and I said, let's just stop now. <laughs> Honestly, you know, I, I don't want to, I felt sorry for the poor guy. Tom O'Dowd, the man you saw, that was a true believer. He really did think in the magic of the, the, the science of Babel, he was told. I did feel sorry for him. I said, let's stop now. You've got your story. It's okay. This went out about a week later, and it led to a snowball effect, which finally brought down the company. Which Yay! Was in, uh, <laughs> people sued the company. It was quite dramatic. And I remember thinking at the time, wow, I've made a difference in the world to the tune of millions of dollars, and none of it has come by. <laughs> case at the moment. And I brought one with me. Oh, yes, 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 yes. This is, I think it's 
valued about 110 Australian dollars, about 90 dollars US. This is the premium wine card. Ooh, look at that. Ooh, what does it mean? How does it work? Let's have a look. So you buy this card from the premium wine card company, and you can turn standard everyday cheapo wine into premium wine. <laughs> How you ask? Welcome to the premium wine card. Premium wine card is the latest technology which allows you to change the taste of ordinary wine into premium wine in just a few seconds. Today I'm going to show you a simple test so you can enjoy better tasting wine for yourself. This glass will have the wine board straight from the bottle and this glass will have the wine treated with the premium wine card. This is the wine board straight from the bottle. Right. In my guess, 
If I was doing it, if I was doing a bit of skullduggery, I would put a little bit of vinegar in a glass or something like that just to make the wine taste up. I mean, look at those expressions. They, those are, I'm reacting to something that is bad, poison, bad expression. So I, I mean, we, we could all laugh at the absurdity of this thing, but they sell it for $110 a card. Wow. And it's just one of the ongoing investigations and things, and we're trying to get government action against this sort of, uh, it's lunacy, but it's fun, isn't it? Yeah. It is, it's, it's Lots fun. of wine drinking. I don't know what we're doing after, but if you want to. Yours for $120. <laughs> 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 oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, yes. Now, the serious side. For many years, the Australian skeptics have been on the uh, forefront, in the forefront fighting the anti-vaccination crowd mm -hmm. in Australia and helping to fight it around the world. And I understand that uh, here next week, this Wednesday, week, the, vax, the, the Wednesday, the vaxed bus is coming to town. Yeah, Fisherman's War. Susan can tell you more about that. But we have been fighting this ever since I've been part of the <laughs> skeptics, the, the anti-vaccination movement around the world, particularly in Australia. And this organization called the Australian Vaccination Network, which had changed their name to Australian to the Australian Skeptic, Vaccination Skeptics Network. <coughs> and now they're called the Australian Vaccination Risks Network. They keep changing their name. But I mean I don't need to tell uh, you too much about the the entrenched mindset of these people when it comes to conspiracy theories. A lot of them honestly and truly and sincerely believe that vaccines are doing no good and they're killing people and they damage you and they give you uh, autism and uh, sins and all the rest of it. It's quite a battle. It is. It's quite. It's quite. A, it's an amazing thing. But we have other groups helping us. There's a group called Stop the Australian Vaccination Network. Beryl Dory was for a long time the president of this anti-vaccination network. We had a lot of dealings with her, and she had a lot of media attention. One of the things I'm very proud that uh, groups like us have helped to do is educate the media. So the media are now far less likely to say, and now we have the other side, and calling <laughs> one of these anti-vaccination people. And in fact, uh, with the help of Dick Smith, who you remember before, who was the man who brought out James Randi. Some years ago, we had a big uh, uh, half page, I think, uh, in one of the national newspapers uh, about promoting vaccination and warning people about the antics of the anti-vaccination people. And it, also we got this is a very popular show in Australia called Media Watch, which looks at news every week and critically analyzes the news. And they were very uh, scathing about news organizations that had on anti-vaccination people, which was a, a good win for us. Uh, now, one of the concerns we have, and this book is still available. I don't know if you've, you've heard of Melanie's Marvelous Measles. Mm -hmm. It's basically a book aimed, book aimed at children to say what a wonderful thing it is to get the measles. And you should get the measles and it's a happy, joyous part of childhood. Look at this, the child has the measles and she's chasing butterflies in the garden. These figures are slightly out of date, but you can see that uh, as recently as 2011, there was thousands upon thousands of, of uh, cases of measles, uh, many deaths, and you may have heard in the last four or five months in Samoa, yep. in the Pacific, mm -hmm. I think it's over a hundred children. Seventy died. something, I think, died. Yeah, Seven. many, many and children growing. died of measles. And, but the anti-vaxxers are still trying to put their spin on it. It's, it's quite disgusting. I mean, I, and I was at this meeting in 2002 where one of the anti-vaxxers was saying that vaccination is a deliberate po a process of genocide. And uh, invoking Hitler and Stalin and things like that. These, these are the extent that these, some of these people can get. But the same sort of people will likely believe in uh, chemtrails dropping things from the sky, uh, one world government, probably moon landing hopes, and all the rest of it. 
seems, seems to be that once you're in that mindset, then the next conspiracy comes to you easily. <laughs> and as I said before, they were forced to change uh, their name because the government deemed that an anti-vaccination group calling itself the Australian Vaccination Network was inherently misleading. So it was another victory for us to get them to change their name. Uh, and again, we have to get uh, stories in the media to help let people know the agenda of the anti-vaccination crowd. And we have uh, uh, a reporter we gave an award to only a couple of years ago who wrote stories about the anti-vaccinations. I mean, forming a sham church so they could say that this child doesn't have to be vaccinated on religious reasons. Things like that. And finally, as we started off my talk, um, privately, although very closely in conjunction with the Australian Skeptics, I am the host and producer of the Skeptic Zone podcast. There's the team. Oh, I'm on the show every week. <laughs> And you can hear them on the show sometimes. I'll be saying, and uh, today, and... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. Who really do help me? And just out of interest, because people ask me this quite a lot, how do I go about recording a podcast? Well, you saw one of the microphones I used. This is a particularly nice, lovely microphone by a German company called Yellowtech, which also processes the... the sounds it's hearing as it's recording and equalizes it and suppresses the background and gives you rich tones it's a wonderful microphone and all those microphones i use uh, to help me do the podcast i have a team of reporters mostly in australia some here in the united states and it's just one of the joys of my life i really love uh, the fact that people listen to the show and come along on a journey with me so all the people who listen to my show uh, later on today will hear all of you and it's, if they shut their eyes, they can always be here with us to enjoy uh, the moment. And as technology changes, I used to do all the editing on a, on a desktop and a laptop. Now it's all done on an iPad. I can do the entire show of music, recording, uh, the artwork, the web interface, all on an iPad, which I can just put into a bag and do it anywhere. In fact, I do a lot of my editing work on trains in Sydney. I jump on the train and away I go to edit the show. That's a marvelous, uh, a marvelous thing for me to do. I can even do it on my iPhone if I want to. The, the, the screen on the iPad is a bit bigger as well. So I want to thank you all very much. Again, it's just such a pleasure to travel uh, to California and I love to visit uh, Susan and Mark and see many of my old friends here in the audience today. So again, thank you very much.